Hello, this is Daryl from House for All Nations International Campus. Thank you so much for being here and, and watching this sermon. Uh, it is laid upon our hearts that this sermon would be used uh, so that your love and affection for Jesus and the church would grow. In no way um, does this replace the church that God's placed you and the shepherd, uh, the pastor that God has placed in your life to shepherd and take care of your soul. Um, but I, I pray that you would continue to join your church um, uh, where, where God is preached and proclaimed there. And so God bless you as you watch this. I pray that you enjoy this. God bless. Hello, um, my name is Joshua or Ochi. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, um, I've been interning at this since uh, September. And I've been doing my MDiv at Regent College. Um, so first time preaching here today. Um, so if it's good, maybe you'll hear me again. If not, then uh, it was nice meeting you all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm, you know, okay. So I was supposed to do this, you know, in front, in person with at least a few people, but now we're on Zoom. Um, but, you know, this is kind of my comfort zone because I, uh, I'm so used to being in front of my computer and also I've been like streaming on Twitch and stuff. So um, if you guys want and you guys want to interact with uh, with me at all during the sermon, you can you can just t uh, type anything in the chat if you want. You can do amens. You can ask me questions. If there's something you want me to uh, go over again, just use chat and, you know, we'll, we'll just have this more dialogical if you guys are open for that. Um, today we are going and looking at Colossians 3, 1 to 11. Um, thank you, Pastor Daryl, for giving me this passage because it's probably like, there's so many sermons you can preach from this passage. Um, I love this passage. There's, uh, and like, I'm just hoping that you guys can see some of the beauty and the richness in this text. Um, so if you have your Bibles, would you open Colossians 3, 1 to 11? I have it here on the screen. Um, if then you all have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, <clears throat> seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you all have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you all, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And these you all too once walked when you were all were living in them. Now you all must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have all put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us um, just, yeah, your word on a on page for us to study, to read. Um, we thank you for your revelation. I pray that you would speak to us. Lord, would you remove any barriers, if there's anything distracting us, if there's any um, any sin, any, any temptations, any attacks of the enemy, Lord, I pray that you'd remove them. Help us hear what you have for us today. Thank you, Lord. Just name I pray. Amen. All right, so let's start with the end, this right here. Um, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Um, you know, I wonder if, if Paul were to write this today, um, I wonder what he would put here instead. Um, you know, you know uh, maybe he would write, uh, you know, the election just happened. Maybe he would write a Democrat and Republican or, or uh, black and white and Asian or um, broke, uh, rich, uh, employee, employer, masker, anti-masker, maybe uh, Pentecostal, Catholic, Mennonite brethren, um, straight, LGBTQ. Uh, maybe he'd write those things instead and, and, and end with Christ is all and end all. Let's start with this end. Um, let's consider this end goal and, and this this final vision, this picture. Um, Christ all in all, Christ who is love, Christ who defines goodness and peace and reconciliation, who is just and justice, who he, he who loves the poor, the oppressed, um, he heals the broken. I mean, isn't this what the world is looking for? Um, you know, don't we desire peace, unity, love, justice, reconciliation? I mean, isn't this the, the cry of the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, isn't this what we hope for in a political system? Isn't this what we look for in religion? Uh, like pure religion, being taking care of the poor, the widow, and the orphan. If this is what you've been wanting, or you've been searching for, you've been trying to figure it out, you've been wondering how to achieve like this kind of justice, this kind of reconciliation, then 
then pay attention. Um, I know this is what I want, uh, but for this to happen, we need to know who Christ is. So uh, let's see how Paul fleshes this out. Um, so we'll back up a little bit. I mean, we've been in the letter of Colossians for the past eight weeks now. Um, and I know there's a few of you here today who may have missed a few sermons or there's my family here. Hi, hi fam. Um, and so I'll just give you a brief refresher. Um, but basically the, this letter to the Colossians, uh, there's this guy in Colossae named Epaphras. And he tells the Apostle Paul while he's in prison about this church in Colossae. So he's like, hey, Paul, you got to check out this church. Let me send you a Zoom link. Um, <laughs> so he hears about this, this church in Colossae. And he's like, um, and he checks them out and he's like, okay, these guys, they're faithful. You know, they're, they're building up uh, their faith. They're being, they're, they're like being really giving to the uh, communities outside of their own church. Um, but they got a few issues. Uh, they have this weird angel worshiping cult thing going on. Um, they got uh, this asceticism thing going on as proto Gnosticism, which is basically like uh, they're they're like neglecting their bodies and they're um, just trying to build up their brains. Um, but like, anyways, again, so so he addresses these things. Um, but but again, I wonder what Paul would have written if it was written today. Um, so these these letters, like I said, they're they're occasional letters, meaning they're written on like for an occasion for a purpose. Uh, something came up. Um, so like if he was writing this to our culture, you know, maybe he would have mentioned instead of angel worship, uh, he would have done like individualism um, where we're so focused on ourselves and, and we don't, you know, think communally. We don't think about our, our, our wider family or body. Uh, maybe instead of asceticism, he'd do consumerism. Um, you know, we just love to consume, to, to try the latest things, to, to eat, you know, the best food or whatever. I mean, the PS5 was just released and, you know, I'm like thinking, oh, am I thinking too much about getting this PS5 or, or, <laughs> or whatnot? Um, maybe instead of uh, proto Nazism, you know, he, he'd address like uh, patriotism, you know, Americans there. They're all about, you know, making America great again. And there's this whole like almost like cult like fanaticism for the country. And, and we all know like Canada is way better than America, right? So. Yeah, but <laughs> um, thank you, Daryl. Uh, so, so Paul writes this letter to them, and and there's this general structure to his letters. But uh, there's two things that I kind of wanted to highlight for you guys. And the first is uh, passage in chapter one, fifteen to twenty. Um, our campus is memorizing this in their care groups. Um, so if you want to know who Jesus is, learn and memorize this. Basically, it's who Jesus is. Um, the image of the invisible God, where all things were created by him and through him and for him and all things hold together in him. And he's the head of the church and he's going to reconcile all things to himself. And, and when we say Christ is all in all, uh, we mean this Christ, um, this one who's just so amazing. He's divine. He's human. He, he came and he revealed himself to us in his life, his death, his resurrection. Uh, he forgave us. He loved his enemies to the point of death. Um, and he defeated like all the dark forces of the universe and uh, he reconciled us to himself. Um, he's able to make us have a right relationship with God unhindered. We're able to have this open uh, receiving gift. Um, uh, God, we were able to receive God's good gifts. So, man, that's that's the Christ that we're um, trying to get to. And, and this next passage um, that also relates to uh, this sermon today is in chapter 2, verse 10. Um, and you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And pay attention to this, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So buried with him in baptism, and you were raised with him, and you've been filled with him. So Christ, all in all, you know, Greek, Jew, uncircumcised, uh, circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, capitalist, socialist, Democrat, Republican, black, white, Asian, indigenous, LGBTQ, the socially marginalized, the one on the street, the desperate, the hungry, the broken, the depressed, the anxious, the frustrated with COVID, um, all of that is buried with him in baptism. We put on Christ, being raised up with him, made alive together with him. This is the background of our passage today. And this is who our passage today is for. Those who have been filled with him, those who have been buried with him in baptism, those who have been raised with him, if you have been raised. So this message is for those who have been raised. And so I was on, uh, I was on Reddit the other day. And uh, you guys know Reddit, right? T type in chat if you spend too much time on Reddit. Also, give me your favorite subreddit. Um, 
my favorite subreddits are r slash awe or funny. Um, so you, you can look us up later and there's a whole bunch of funny jokes and cute pictures of cats and stuff. Um, but anyways, I was on the, I was on the Christian and Catholic subreddits during the American elections and man, it was, it was crazy over there. Uh, people were saying things like, uh, you can't be Christian and Democrat, they murder babies. Uh, while others were like, you can't support Trump, you know, who doesn't help the poor, the alien, the immigrant. And, you know, he flaunts this toxic masculinity and you, know, you got to grab women. But, and, and she's like, you know, objectifying them. And, and, you know, you can't support Trump and call yourself Christian either. And there's all of this kind of crazy rhetoric. And, and it's like really emotionally charged. And people are just fighting over this. And, and I was pretty taken aback by, by this division. Um, I couldn't help but feel a little bit sad that this was the state of the church in America. And maybe it's not the whole church, it's just the one or two percent that are on Reddit. But um, like we had this pastor from Arizona the other day uh, speaking on my class um, on Thursday. And so she's white, she's married to a black. Um, they started addressing racism in their church and, and like a hundred white people left from the congregation. Some of them were just blatantly racist. Some of them didn't like hearing the truth. Some of them just felt like it wasn't their problem. So they want to just get back to the Bible. Let's hear the pastor preach on other stuff. Um, so they just left. And like these political issues and the things that people identified themselves so strongly with, they caused rifts and divisions in the church. But like, how do we actually be a people who have peace with each other? How do we heal these rifts that divide us? How can we, instead of being defined by our race or our economic status or our jobs or our political stance, how can we be defined by people who, by, by like the love that we have for one another? How do we, if you look at verse five, how do we, how do we like, oh, one second. <laughs> ignore, ignore, ignore. Uh -huh. This is what happens when you press control X. Oops, totally lost my uh, train of thought. How do we like actually be this people who who have Christ all in all? How do we put to death what is earthly in us? You know, sexual immorality, uh, impurity, passion, and all this kind of stuff. Um, give me one second. Just got lost in my notes. <laughs> uh, so again, if Paul is addressing our culture, and you look you look at this verse five, um, you know I wonder what what he would put. Uh, have we put to death, let's say, racism, uh, porn, homophobia, uh, political differences, uh, destructive habits with the environment and nature? How do we Canadians reconcile with the indigenous people? How do we uh, reconcile with our fellow Christians who who might see things differently? I mean, like we all know the sin that we have in ourselves, and, and we also can clearly see like the sin that other people have. So how do we actually put that all aside and, and put these things to death? Well, this passage starts with, if then you have been raised with Christ. So there's this big if. It's conditional. Um, everything that follows the if then is only for those who have been raised with Christ. If you've been raised to death, uh, if you've been raised to death, like raised from life, um, if you've been buried with him in baptism, um, and you were raised with them. So everything that follows, yeah, it's, it's um, <laughs> everything that follows the if then. So, you know, like if you have been raised, then put to racism. If you have been raised, put away poor. And if you've been raised, put away consumerism. If you've been raised with Christ, put away uh, the individualism, the, the things that make you think about only yourself and the pleasures of this world. Instead, seek the better things. Seek this end goal of reconciliation between all. Um, and I think, you know, this, this, this end goal of reconciliation for all, you know, the cry of the Black Lives Matter movement, all these things, I think it's only possible for those who have been raised with Christ. Um, so again, those who have been raised with Christ are those who have put away the body of flesh by the circumcision of, of Christ, who have been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him. Um, so yeah, this, this, this portion of the letter, chapter 3, 1 to 11, it's addressed to those people um, 
those who have received the baptism, those who have been buried, those who have buried their old selves in that pool, that lake, that river, that ocean, who've washed away their old self and have been raised up out of that water and clothed themselves with this new created body, the new self, those who have been made alive, you know, followers of Jesus Christ, raise your hand. Um, if you've been baptized, this is for you. And so um, if you grew up in the Catholic or Eastern Orthodox Church, you might know this guy, uh, St. Basil. He was a 4th century Cappadocian father. He helped produce the Nicene Creed, one of the most orthodox statements on the Trinity. Uh, he lived this ascetic monastic life, but he didn't withdraw from the culture, but he influenced the culture and the church. And so I'm going to read this uh, really long quote from him on baptism. Uh, hopefully you guys like to hear some stuff from dead people. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to hope that, you know, you guys can remember what I said in two days from now, but, but this guy has written stuff that has lasted 1,600 years. So um, anyways, here we go. Um, from St. Basil, for perfection of life, the imitation of Christ is necessary, not only in the example of gentleness, loneliness, and long-suffering set us in his life, but also in his actual death. So Paul, the imitator of Christ, that being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attend, attain unto the resurrection of the dead, how then are we made in the likeness of Christ's death? And that we were buried with him by baptism. It is necessary that the continuity of the old life be cut. This is impossible lest a man be born again. So before beginning the second life, it is necessary to put an end to the first, for just as in the case with runners who turn and take a second course, turning around, kind of doing a halt and pause, uh, intervening between the movements in the opposite direction. So also making a change in lives, it seems necessary for death to come as a mediator between the two, ending all that goes before and beginning all that comes after. How then do we achieve this? Descent into hell by imitating through baptism the burial of Christ for the bodies of the baptized, as it were, were buried in the water. Baptism then symbolically signifies the putting off the old works of the flesh. Because in baptism, two ends are proposed. On the one hand, the destroying of the body of sin, that it may never bear fruit unto death. And on the other hand, our living unto the spirit and having our fruit in holiness, the water, receiving the body in a tomb, as a tomb, figures death, while the Spirit pours in his quickening power, renewing our souls from the deadness of sin into the original life. Um, so I know that there are some of you here who may be baptized as infants, uh, others who are uh, baptized in older age. Uh, each fan is a Mennonite Brethren Church, so I'll put out from their, uh, their confession of faith uh, what baptism is. Um, so here they say baptism means the incorporation of people who have been cleansed from sin and gifted with a new life into the church as one body. It's this powerful sociological event. It incorporates believers into the church. It erases all cultural, racial, ethnic, class, and gender distinctions that divide people in the world. Baptism affects community and levels of ground in the community. It's a holistic understanding of baptism, uh, which walks between the two options of sacrament and symbol. It affects real change that reflects both divine grace and human reality. The men and brethren use this uh, expression sign for baptism, which is basically a combination of divine and human action. It's both symbolically representative uh, of repentance and salvation and effectual. It does something more. And so I'm going to say something that might be a little controversial, and that's baptism produces faith. Baptism produces faith. Now, now the men and brethren, uh, we stress the believer's baptism. So when you have faith, when you repent and you believe in Christ, you place your faith in Christ, then you get baptized. I'm going to flip it a bit and say, if you've been baptized, your baptism will produce faith in you to the extent that you reflect and you remember your baptism and, and you understand the significance of your baptism. And so I remember my baptism clearly. Um, even though it took place like nearly 20 years ago. It was, it was sunny, Pastor Sonny was there along with a bunch of my friends and family. Uh, we were in the pool in Stillwood Camp. Um, it was probably like 25 degrees, it's perfect. Uh, we sang some songs, there was an acoustic guitar there. I, I don't remember if you were playing, Daryl, uh, for my baptism, but um, I, remember, I remember confessing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I remember having my nose plugged and being dipped back and being raised back up again. Um, and I don't know if you can remember your baptism like I do. Um, and, and you know, if you haven't been baptized, uh, I'll let your pastor walk you through um, the steps of baptism, how to get baptized, whether or not infant baptism is a thing, whether you should get rebaptized, all that hard work, I'm going to leave to your pastor. Um, but I know that since the day of my baptism, I haven't truly really reflected deeply on my baptism till about a few weeks ago. And it was in this discussion with one of my profs 
Um, and he was talking about the significance of baptism. And so he's the one who says that, you know, uh, he's the one who said baptism produces faith. Um, but if you understand baptism as, as being incorporated into this body, um, the sociological, sociological aspect that I was talking about, um, it becomes a part of your identity. You know, like you can say, I'm, the, I'm one who has been baptized. I'm, I'm someone who has been risen out of that water. If you reflect and you meditate on your baptism, on the symbol of Christ's death and resurrection, you visualize your dead body in that water, being risen up with new flesh, uh, with Christ clothing you, and you're hidden in Christ, seated in the heavenly places. You know, I think it produces faith. I think it can produce new feelings, new actions. I think, I think baptism actually does something. Um, if you know and you reflect on its significance. So practically, let's say you, you know, do you wash your face every morning and night? Remember your baptism. Uh, do you enjoy swimming? Uh, remember your baptism every time you get up out of that water. Uh, do you love music? Listen to something that makes you think and reflect on your identity. Uh, do you love art or Instagram? You know, take a picture of water. Um, remember your baptism. You, know, you see water, remember your baptism. You know, I can just give you that one image. So if then, if you've been raised, if you've been baptized into Christ's death, um, dying to your former self, and you've been raised up out of that water, out of the abyss, raised up into a life hidden in Christ, clothed in Christ, that Christ may be all in all, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, the idea of seated at the right hand of God, um, it's all over scripture. You'll see it in the Gospels, you'll see it in Psalms, Paul's letters. Uh, can you think of one person who literally saw Christ seated at the right hand of God. Uh, that picture might give you a hint. Um, think X. Let's see, I'll give you three seconds in chat if you can think of who that is. Ah, John, you got it. Okay, nice. Stephen, if you don't know Stephen, you can check him out in Acts 6 to 7. Uh, he was a preacher who was getting something of a following, preaching in a synagogue that had people from all over. And, and some of these people in the synagogue, they didn't like how he was so good at it. And he spoke this message of change, of, of repentance, peace, and reconciliation. And, and these guys, you know, they liked their old ways better and the power and position that they had. So they seized, uh, they seized Stephen because he was threatening their position. And so he was captured and he was brought forth in front of this high priest and all his council. And so when Stephen was in front of this council, he retold him the Genesis story all the way up to the point of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, and then he kind of dissed them. Uh, he called them stubborn murderers who were uncircumcised in heart, resisting the Holy Spirit, killing the prophets, and finally killing Jesus. And, and so they got mad, and they decided to stone Stephen. Um, so if you check out in Acts 7.55, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and rushed together at them. Then they cast him out to the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, a.k.a. Paul, uh, before he became a Christian. So Saul was there. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep and Saul approved of his execution. So let's go back to 3.1. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So Stephen set his mind to where Christ was, at the right hand of God. You know, being barraged by stones, being beaten, being bruised, hurting, bleeding to the point of death, he set his mind to where Christ is. He saw Christ seating at the right hand of God. So I wonder, are you hurt? Are you, are you broken? Like, are you hurting right now? Um, is COVID wearing you out? Is school tough? Uh, is a coworker or client getting on your nerves? Um, do you feel the pain of, of the broken, the hurting, maybe the black and indigenous community, uh, the pain of the, you know, in the persecution of the LGBTQ community, uh, the political upheaval, the cry of the unborn? Um, maybe you feel the pain of the sex slave industry or, or the pain of the, the persecution of our Christian brothers and sisters, you know, maybe in the Middle East. Stephen, he set his mind to where Christ is, at the right hand of God, where he is seated until he makes all his enemies his footstool. There in that place where Stephen put his mind, where he hid his life, he cried out and with his last breath, yet in a loud voice, he said, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Stephen's last act was one of reconciliation. And you know, I wonder if Paul 
was recalling this scene as he wrote this letter. I wonder if this is what he had in mind when he wrote, you know, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I wonder if it was this kind of forgiveness. And so Silvan of Athos, um, he's this Eastern Orthodox monk who, he died about 80 years ago, um, so hasn't been dead for too long. Um, but he said, the love of enemies is the only infallible criterion of our spiritual progress. In the image of God, human beings become fully persons when they transcend their own nature and giving their life not merely for their friends, but also their enemies. So for followers of Jesus Christ, um, do you ever rate your, uh, your spiritual progress? Um, I think this measurement is pretty accurate. Like, I know I have a long way to go in this area. Um, I don't know where, where you guys are at, um, but like who you consider your enemies. I, I don't know um, who you don't get along well with, who you're willing to give your life up for, but, but this was the example set by Jesus. This was the example of what Stephen did. And I think this is what Paul was thinking of when he wrote this. So friends, if you have been raised with Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated. If our mind is there, I don't think it'll be here on earth. And, and you know, he names some sexual immorality, porn, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, all this idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, obscene talk, slander, all of these things which we once walked, maybe we're still walking in, we put to death now in the waters of our baptism. And instead, we, if you go to verse 9 to 10, we put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, renewed in the image of Christ, renewed with knowledge after Christ. As we become like him, as we put on Christ and his knowledge, and we then I think we can achieve this, this vision, this, this vision of peace and reconciliation between, you know, Greek, Jew, slave, free, Democrat, Republican, black, white, gay, straight. You know, as, as we put on Christ and he becomes our all in all, I think that's how we can have you know, this peace and reconciliation. So friends, in conclusion, if you have been raised with Christ, remember your baptism. Meditate on it. Remember that you died in those waters. Uh, picture your rise from those waters as if you've been clothed in this, these white robes of Christ adorned by the Holy Spirit. Keep setting your mind on these things above you. You know, remember, Keep your setting your mind on Christ. Remember Stephen, who was stoned, bathed in blood, baptized in blood, with his eyes set on Jesus, forgiving his enemies. Like Stephen, leave your dead works in those waters, in the blood of the baptism, and put on, as you put off those things that you feel so strongly about, think of all those things that you hold so strongly about your identity. And as, you, as you put those things to death, all the things that are not holy of Christ, maybe you can forgive you know, those ignorant, the ones who, who don't know Christ, or maybe they do know Christ, but you got some differences. Um, maybe they're not yet fully in Christ, all in all, Christ all in all, Christ in everything. Maybe then, as we put away those things, we can have some measure of reconciliation. But only if we're willing to go, I think, as far as Stephen did. Um, I, I don't think there could be half measures. I think we got to go all the way. But it's also a, a process. Mm. And friends, if you haven't been raised, if you haven't received this baptism, and you, and you want these things, you want to see peace, you want to see reconciliation, you want to die to some of these earthly things that, that, that consume you, you know, anger or malice or, or coveting or, or jealousy, um, all these things that come along with our consumeristic and individualistic culture. Um, if you want to belong to a communi community where we together are striving for peace between all, then I urge you to see Christ. It starts with repentance, uh, which is acknowledging our lack and our, our just our utter need for God. It starts with turning our inner selves towards God and recognizing the need for Jesus Christ to do the work of raising us up from death to life. Then the next step would be to search out one of our pastors or one of the leaders in this church to be discipled and mentored. And then you can get this baptism in Jesus' name and, and into this community of believers. And I think together we can get some small sense of this vision which is like this bond of love that in Jesus, Jesus Christ, all in all, we can have this reconciliation, this foretaste, I think, of heaven. So to summarize 3 to 11, who is this for? Those who have been raised with him in baptism. What's it about? Verses 3 to 10, putting off the old self with his practices, putting on the new self, which is being continuously renewed in the image of its creator, Christ Jesus. The how, verses 1 to 2, 
by seeking the things that are above, remembering Stephen and his death, picturing Jesus at the right hand of God, remembering your baptism, remembering Christ, and the new humanity that you have in him. And I didn't address the when, but um, if you've been baptized, this is a past event. Uh, the setting of your minds, the seeking, this is something that we continue to do. Like like putting on new underwear, you got to keep changing out the old, putting on the new. Uh, the Greek verbs for, for seeking and setting, they have this continuous sense to them. Um, so we don't stop. We, 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 do, we won't stop until death. And it's going to take work. It's going to take hard work. It's not automatic. I mean, this is why Christians are still divided to this day. But that's okay. Uh, we can taste heaven. We can taste God's kingdom even in moments today. And it's not going to be perfect until, you know, death is finally defeated at the resurrection. But at least let's enjoy a few moments of that now together, you know? In verse 11, the why, the goal, Christ, all in all, Christ Jesus. Christ who is our peace, reconciliation, love, joy, the gospel of redemption, forgiveness, Christ, all of Christ in all of us. That's why. So let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us this vision of, of you and all of us, of us having all of you put on, of, of Stephen who, who was able to die and forgive with his last act, his last breath, who set his mind on you, who saw you seated at the right hand. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who have this vision of you on the right hand of God, seated in glorious, majestic places where our very lives are hidden in you. Lord, I pray this, that this vision would be so deeply ingrained that, Lord, we would remember our baptism, that every moment of every day we would remember who we are in you, that we are a new creation. We, are, you, we have you in all of us. And so, Lord, would you do your work? Would you change whatever part in our heart that needs to be changed? Would you um, just impress yourself onto us today? Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.